so we're talking Neanderthal today. You know what they had? Hair like mine, don't you dare. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we are delving into a very interesting intersection between history, science and nonsense. Now if you are constantly terminally online, and I mean look at you, you will have definitely run into the theory, should we say provocative theory, of the Neanderthal being an apex predator, a monster, given superhuman strength, so menacing that it almost drove us, modern humans, to extinction. This is the theory of the Neanderthals as apex predators. Now it wouldn't be fair of me to say this is just a theory, it's not. It's a theory, it's a book, it's many articles online, and it's a lot of YouTube videos, and I imagine TikToks, but I'm not gonna check, I'm not clicking TikTok today. No. Sometimes even very popular channels bringing it up. The reason why it's become so popular is because, I mean, it's intriguing. With that being said, the moment you analyze it with through critical lenses, uh, you'll start to see that the whole thing falls apart when you compare it or put it next to actual documented evidence and science. On this channel, I'm just kind of briefly mentioning it, but then I'll go into the actual evidence. But if you want to hear it and, and you want to be told in a really fun and entertaining way that you should absolutely check out the Y Files. I mean, they're a channel that I like watching and uh, even though I have kind of countered their arguments once when I made my video on whether the ancient Greeks could see blue, which is I think one of my best videos ever. So on that video, I completely disagreed with what they were presenting. With that being said, I like the host. I think it's really fun. This video specifically that they dedicated to the Neanderthal apex is quite fair and it's excellently made. Now, I don't think they push it in the sense that they recreate it and the guy has a really good way to do like a storytelling event where he describes a post, so how it could have been from the experience of an actual ancient human. It's, it's fascinating. But at the end, even though he does say that not many people take this one seriously and it's very debated, I think on this video I'll do my part and say no, it's completely debunkable and I will. But it's a great video, it's a good watch, so you should totally check it out. With that being said, let's begin to shed light onto the mountain problem. The general idea behind the theory is that intensive predation by Neanderthal generated the selective pressure to transform early humans into modern humans. We could divide this theory into two. The first section that we are going to debunk heavily is how they describe physically, genetically, and in general when it comes to overall everyday habits of the Neanderthal as a subspecies of human. The second part is, however, the way they describe the effects of Homo sapien settlements and their proximity to Neanderthal settlements and how these effects shaped who we are as a species. In other words, the intensive predation by Neanderthal, which, according to the theory, generated the selective pressure to transform early humans into modern humans. We are told that we constantly were decimated, killed, hunted as prey for tens of thousands of years by Neanderthal, and get this, this is the craziest part, all of this intensive predation killed pretty much every modern human on the planet, leaving as little as a small tribe of 50. This is the most nonsensical, absolutely absurd part of the theory. Imagine that. So there are, I don't know, tens of thousands of Neanderthals specimen, and there are only 50 Homo sapiens sapiens left in the world, only 50 of us left in the world and somehow, I don't know, we hide in the caves and then we go out and then some of them would have died because of weather conditions and then we just murder all of the others and then they die and now we inhabit the earth. That's insane. Not only from a logical standpoint, I mean just apply reason and logic for a moment, but also because of the actual evidence that we have, for example migratory patterns of early humans as I will present here. Now it is true that anatomically and behaviorally we are different than any species on this planet. And of course there would have been a difference between us and Neanderthal. After all, we are different species. However, this whole idea of Neanderthal being basically monsters covered in thick fur is not supported by scientific nor genetic evidence. Hopefully this video will provide a comprehensive framework for the critical analysis of the theory. The outline of the theory posits that Neanderthal, with their robust build and hunting prowess, were dominant predators of the time. This speculative 
primitive narrative suggests that their predatory nature placed immense pressure on early Homo sapiens, pushing our ancestors to the brink of extinction. The idea that Neanderthal were apex predators with superhuman strength that almost drove Homo sapiens to extinction is largely a myth, not supported by current scientific or genetic evidence. While Neanderthal were indeed successful hunters and had a strong, robust physique, the notion of their superhuman strength is an exaggeration, and the near extinction of Homo sapiens is a fantasy, an interesting one indeed, but still a myth. Strength. Neanderthals were stockier and more muscular than modern humans, but their strength was not necessarily superhuman per se. Their physical advantages were likely due to their adaptation to colder climates and a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. More on the hunter-gatherer gatherer part of that sentence later. Intelligence. Neanderthal had a brain size similar or sometimes even slightly larger than modern humans. They produced complex tools, practiced burial rituals and possibly had language abilities indicating a level of intelligence comparable to Homo sapiens. So this idea that they were brute monsters that wouldn't even make clothes and would just... It, no. No. However, when it comes to the brain size, even though the actual brain matter might have been larger, that does not mean that they would have been more intelligent. In fact, we were more intelligent than them. Cognitive abilities. Both species had similar brain sizes, but Homo sapiens would have had a slightly more developed prefrontal cortex associated with higher cognitive functions. Homo sapiens demonstrated more complex symbolic thinking, as evidenced by their more advanced art, jewellery and burial practices. It is of course impossible to talk about Neanderthal without mentioning one of the most comprehensive and detailed studies that was ever made uh, when it comes to the Neanderthal, which is the Neanderthal Genome Project. This was a collaborative effort involving researchers from several institutions, including the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. The project, led by genetist Abo, aimed to sequence the entire genome of a Neanderthal individual. In 2010, the research team published their findings in the journal Science, titled A Draft Sequence of the Neanderthal Genome. Now, this groundbreaking study provided the first full genetic makeup of Neanderthal species, which is also where we get this idea that indeed Neanderthal and early humans interbred, leaving within our DNA up to a 4% Neanderthal DNA still in existence. The study was based on the analysis of DNA extracted from three Neanderthal bones found in the Vindija cave in Croatia, which were estimated to be around 38,000 to 44,000 years old. The researchers used advanced DNA sequencing technologies and bioinformatic tools to reconstruct the Neanderthal genome with high accuracy. Since then, several follow-up studies have been conducted, refining and expanding our knowledge of Neanderthal based on the initial findings of the Neanderthal Genome Project. Some notable studies the following. Such a highly documented and professionally conducted project should be the basis of our analysis and postulations about not only Neanderthal itself as a species, but also their interaction with us. Also because due to this project, which is based on data, not complete fantasy and speculation, is how we found out that there were in fact even more different species, aka the Denisovans. The ecological record and genetic evidence paints a more nuanced picture of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens interactions. While it's true that these two species did cohabit our planet for a good 50,000 years, which is clearly a significant amount of time, the exact duration of this coexistence is still a topic of ongoing research and debate among archaeologists and anthropologists. We also know that the last Neanderthal population lived in the Iberian Peninsula and possibly in Siberia until about 40,000, 30,000 years ago. And during this period, of coexistence, there is evidence of interbreeding between the two species, as mentioned, and that is indicated by the presence of Neanderthal DNA in the genomes of modern humans from Eurasia. This suggests that the two species interacted and interbred to some extent during their time together on Earth. However, far from being continuous and constant competitors, evidence suggests that periods of coexistence, exchange and possible trade occurred. In fact, it's not far-fetched to imagine that two intelligent species would understand that at some point there might be situations in which which cooperation, for example, to hunt very difficult prey or in moments of difficult and resource scarcity would be in fact the best option. Even if you hate your neighbors, still that might be the best thing and we shouldn't imagine these people or ancient humans to be idiots. 
Scientific studies of Neanderthal diet and lifestyle reveal a species adapted to diverse environments. Isotopic analysis of Neanderthal bones shows a varied diet, including plant matter, which contradicts the notion of them being hypercarnivorous predators who sought human flesh and blood. Moreover, evidence of care for the elderly and injured suggests a complex social structure rather than a purely aggressive nature. Anatomy and Physiology Neanderthals were generally more robust, with shorter limbs and a larger rib cage, which may have been an adaptation to colder climates. Homo sapiens had a more gracile build, which might have been advantageous for long-distance travel and adapting to diverse environments. Having said that, I'd like now to spend a word or two about the actual Homo sapiens Neanderthal interaction and what we know. If you're enjoying this video so far, please take a moment to check out my Patreon page. With as little as a $5 support, you can help us ensure that we can continue to produce high quality and high researched content. And at the same time, you get access to polls, extra videos, unlisted streams, and much more. Thank you so much. Now that we have an overall understanding of the situation, how about we spend a moment or two to discuss the logical inconsistencies. While the theory captivates the imagination, it falters under scrutiny. To begin with, portraying Neanderthals as an apex predator oversimplifies their ecological role and underestimates the complexity of prehistoric ecosystems. Predatory dominance alone, for example, does not equate to the capability of driving another species to near extinction. Think, for example, complex wars which we know occurred in the prehistorical period. Just thinking that the most brutal or the strongest would always win during a systematic series of battles is insane. We know for a fact that even though Neanderthals were tactical, for example in their approaches to killing big game, say for example a big elephant or mammoth, still strategy tactics, better weapons, better organization, better systems, even for example bows and arrows, there are so many things that ambushes that play pivotal roles when it comes to even early and prehistorical warfare, they're just thinking, oh well they were the predator, the apex predator, and therefore every time they would destroy Homo sapiens is nonsense. We probably killed each other, we won many, they won many, and it is what it is. Raiding villages, destroying things, burning things down, all of this absolutely happened on both sides. A central claim is that the human population dwindled to as few as 50 individuals due to Neanderthal predation. This assertion is at odds with genetic studies indicating that while Homo sapiens experienced population reductions, these events occurred over enormous spans of time, almost unfathomable for us, and were influenced by a multitude of factors, for example changes in the weather, infectious diseases rather than solely predation or war with a single specific species aka Neanderthals. Moreover, another inconsistency is the idea that all of this somehow happened everywhere in the world simultaneously, whenever and wherever these two species existed. This doesn't consider discussions of migration patterns and archaeological evidence supporting larger, more diverse population worldwide. Not to mention it's very probable that already the original Homo sapiens had moved and inhabited and reached, for example, modern-day Australia, before all of this supposed driving us near the brink of extinction had happened, which would already debunk it. Technology Neanderthals were skilled toolmakers, primarily using the Mosterian stone tool technology, which was well studied for their hunting and foraging lifestyle. Homo sapiens developed more diverse and sophisticated tools, including projectile weapons and fishing gear, allowing them to exploit a wider range of resources. Social structure and communication systems Neanderthals likely lived in a small, close-knit group and had a social structure that revolved around kinship. Homo sapiens had larger social networks and more complex social structures, which may have facilitated the exchange of ideas and resources between groups. Homo sapiens also developed more advanced language capabilities which could have enhanced their ability to cooperate, plan and adapt to new situations. Which also makes it difficult to really believe that Homo sapiens everywhere on the planet just couldn't take on Neanderthals because they were bigger and stronger. It doesn't work like that. Like, whenever we look at our planet and how anything living interacts, yes, if you put a modern human inside a cage with a tiger, the tiger will win. But give a human a gun and put them a hundred meters away with a sniper, 
the tiger is dead. Why wouldn't that have happened considering the cognitive differences between these two species between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals? Well guess what? It did happen because they went extinct. Substance strategies. Neanderthals were primarily hunter-gatherers, relying heavily on large game and plant resources in their local environments. Homo sapiens had a more diverse diet, incorporating a wide range of plant and animal resources, and were more adept at exploiting new food sources in different environments. Mobility and exploration. Neanderthals generally stayed within their local regions and were less prone to long-distance travel and exploration. Homo sapiens were more mobile and exploratory, which allowed them to colonize new territories territories and adapt to a variety of territories across the globe. Another major advantage of Homo sapiens over Neanderthal is the higher population densities and more diverse gene pools driven by our ability to inhabit a wide range of places. Our species also developed complex cognitive abilities enabling abstract thinking which connects to problem solving and planning. These traits combined with our social and technological innovation ensured our resilience in the face of all sorts of ecological challenges including any possible, quote-unquote, predation. Coexistence. Homo sapiens and Neanderthal coexisted for thousands of years in Europe and parts of Asia. Genetic evidence suggests that the two species interbred, with many modern humans carrying a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA. Now, the book theorizes that whenever we have interbred is always by force. Now, that of course may well have been the case. It's in fact very likely that it would have happened, but it's not necessarily always the case. It is very possible, since they weren't monsters and we've covered in fur, that it may have happened that a Neanderthal man and one of our women or vice versa would have happened by choice. It's not impossible and it should not be uh, taken out of the equation unless you want to make a horror movie, which of course this guy is trying to do. Extinction. Neanderthals went extinct around 40,000 years ago, but the reason for their extinction is still debated. Possible factors include climate change, competition with Homo sapiens for resources, and assimilation through interbreeding. However, there is no evidence to suggest that Neanderthals nearly drove Homo sapiens to extinction. In summary, while Neanderthals were well adapted to their environment and were successful hunters, the idea of their superhuman strength and near extinction of Homo sapiens is indeed a myth. In summary, both Neanderthal and Homo sapiens were highly adaptable and resourceful, each employing unique strategies to survive in a challenging world. But while Neanderthals were indeed formidable and skilled in their own right, it was the unparalleled adaptability, technological innovation and social complexity of Homo sapiens that ultimately allowed our species to thrive and spread across the globe. And it's based on all of these factors and the analysis of this data that I hereby refute this fantasy idea of Neanderthal, the apex monster. With that being said, as always, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.